delighted to have all of you uh, here joining us today. Uh, uh, my audio description is I'm pale. I have uh, hair that hasn't been cut since pre-pandemic that's brownish red, and I am wearing a black turtleneck. Um, my name is Talia. I am co-director of Civic Signals, a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and director of the Center for Media Engagement. And researchers at the center, like Tamara Wilner and Gina Masulo, have been critical to our work. And I'm here today because I think that much is amiss in the digital public. And I think that there's something that we as a community can do about it. And hey, everybody, I'm uh, Eli Pariser. Um, my audio description, I'm, I'm a white dude, Jewish, uh, with dark brown hair, and I'm wearing a kind of gray sweater and I've got a little bit of a beard. Um, and uh, I uh, come out of kind of a number of different projects with technology, media, media and democracy, um, from uh, helping run Move On in the 2000s to co-founding Upworthy and writing the book, The Filter Bubble. And right now I'm co-directing Civic Signals uh, with Talia. And um, this is such a thrill to all be together in this conversation. Um, I really am here because I believe that people deserve better digital spaces and that democracy demands it. And um, I'm also here because I wanna learn from all of you. So over the next few days, you'll be meeting other members of our Civic Signals team, uh, new, uh, Neelam and Marina and Romy, and um, we'll share a little bit more about what we're up to and hopefully how we can all work together. Um, so Talia, over to you. So that's enough about us. Uh, let's talk a bit about you. Uh, this is a really interesting, varied group, and we have urbanists and community builders. We have librarians, game designers, entrepreneurs, activists, academics, journalists, futurists. You can, you can just list the gamut of people that we have here. And we come from places all over the world and a lot of different cultures. And there are some really significant power differentials in the room. And beyond this Zoom, there are actually thousands of others who have signed up to watch on the live stream. And we think that this is actually an important feature of what we're doing today, because we spend a lot of time in homogenous groups these days. And so to us, this is such an incredible opportunity to be part of a heterogeneous group. But I think we also want to acknowledge that, you know, we're not all on the same page about everything in this group, from the role of big tech to our views on what needs to change. And that's both like a beautiful and challenging thing, because this is a moment, uh, especially right now, where gathering and sustaining groups with a lot of difference isn't easy. And especially uh, if like me, you're in the United States after the attack on the Capitol last week, um, you know, I know my emotions are running high. I know a lot of other folks are. And um, so it's a hard time to kind of have these conversations across difference. And I think this is a place where uh, our public space theme is helpful actually, um, because public spaces hold these kinds of tensions all the time. In a way, it's what public space is about. And uh, it's not easy work, but it's vital work. It's also part of why uh, we've designed this program with a lot of art. And there are probably about 50 artists that have contributed to uh, what you're gonna see. And that's partly about beauty and joy and, and finding uh, those moments. Um, but it's also about how art and play can help us find different ways of being together. So our request to you is to help make this the kind of space that you want to be a part of. Uh, let's not assume we're all alike or we all agree, but let's engage with each other in a generous and a curious way. And if you're finding a conversation that's getting too heated for you, it's, it's okay to step back too. You should expect some discomfort and some provocation. I'm sure that some of the exercise and moments will feel somewhat uncomfortable or weird. It, don't worry, it will for me too. Uh, <laughs> we encourage you to just go with it, but ultimately do what's best for you. And we should also know that we're trying to experiment in form, not just in content. And sometimes when you feel uncomfortable, that's actually the point of it. It's like friction, if you will. But we also really want feedback if something isn't working for you. So if that's the case, go to suggestion box, that channel in Discord, and please let us know. And I should also say, if you're in a conversation that's really not sitting right with you or you're feeling harassed, get our Discord moderators involved. We have believe in moderators. We've got a great team uh, on board um, to help out. 
few other thoughts. Just um, if you're a person who talks a lot, uh, try talking a little less and checking yourself. I'm, I'm one of those people. Um, if you're a person who doesn't talk a lot, like step in. We, we want to hear what you have to say. Um, let's all be kind of good bystanders in conversations as well. So if they're getting out of hand, step in to move things in a positive direction. Um, as you've heard, we've kind of got more, more fully public and more private spaces in this conversation as well. And so the main sessions are all gonna be live streamed, but there will be some breakouts and other kinds of conversational spaces. And we ask that people kind of uh, observe the Chatham House rule uh, in those spaces. So basically anything that people say on the live stream, you're welcome to quote and share, um, but in uh, the breakouts and in discords, um, you know, ask, the, ask uh, permission first. And we'll be documenting stuff in a lot of different ways as well as tools for everyone else. So taking a step back, we want to ask what's this event for and what are we really trying to do here? What we want to do is we, we hope to make forward progress on working together. Uh, we know that we're not going to solve or resolve everything, especially the big topics of today, but a step forward is what, what we ultimately want to do. We want to try to build a space that's a little bit more long-term focused, hopefully some sort of a break from the unending Twitter feed. And we really thought of this as like, it's not a tech conference because in the long run, we believe that it's critical to actually build together people from a variety of different disciplines to envision new ways we could build healthy digital spaces. It's not something that's gonna come from Silicon Valley alone. So, you know, despite the current mess online and offline, this event is really about holding on to our fierce hope that a better a better place can be and should be, and um, that we can do that together. And then building on that hope by learning from each other, um, creating collaborations and connections, and ultimately, you know, ideas that turn into projects and public products that make people's digital lives better. And this is not the last time that we'll say it, but this was a massive and group effort and we could go on for days thanking everyone that's been involved with this. We wanna particularly thank our funders, including the Knight Foundation, the Midyar Network, One Project, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Stand Together. We're truly grateful for the support. And many of you on this, on this uh, Zoom and on the live stream have helped uh, us think about this and an extraordinary team has helped to put this together. Um, so what can you expect? So today we're talking about the values and limits of public spaces and how those qualities might be brought into digital life. Tomorrow, we'll dig into a key topic, safety, and explore some provocations about what digital life might need, and then finish up with a showcase of nine great real current projects that are trying to build better digital spaces. And on Thursday, we'll hear a group of visionaries talk about the future of public life online and have a chance to create attendee-led sessions to start thinking about the next pieces of this work. And in between all of that, we're trying to bring some fun moments, some interesting interactions, and some worthwhile conversations. So one last thing, um, you know, as you probably have already observed, this is all an experiment that we're co-creating together. Um, and even with the pandemic, you know, we're all kind of learning, working through the process of being ourselves online. So I just wanna ask that everybody kind of embrace that spirit of experimentation in the variety of tools and platforms. Um, we are working hard to make sure that they all work, but some probably won't. There'll be glitches and hiccups alongside uh, the laughter. And um, I just really appreciate everyone's curiosity and patience as we learn together. So lean into that with us. And with that, I think we're ready to get started. What we call our public sphere has over history often been a merger of public and private and the sort of achievement of a kind of synergistic relationship between them. So the Bema that I just showed you from Athens was a fully public construction. Here in Rome, we have a space where full of private activity, commercial activity, and yet conversations that were public and political in nature occurred here. Groups formed, associations gathered to drive their political views forward. If we go to the next slide, we're in London, early modern London in the 17th century, where again, um, we see a merger of private and public. The coffee houses are famously um, described by Jürgen Habermas, German political philosopher, as the site of the emergence of the modern public sphere. Why were they so important? Because that's where you could go get a newspaper. There weren't enough 
physical copies to go around for them to all be delivered to people's doorsteps. So people gathered where the discourse was. And that's the really important point. Discourse itself is a gathering point. It's a point of connection. And so we had print culture expanding in this period, newspapers bringing news from distant lands. This is the age of colonization now underway, of course. So there's that news as well as the news of the day. And again, clubs connected to coffee houses, associations formed, uh, challenges to the king would emerge from this context and negotiation among different categories of people, merchants, um, artisans, and so forth um, in the coffee house. So economic questions, political questions, social questions, all intersected, again, around a convening space anchored by discourse. Um, next slide takes us all the way up into the 21st century. Um, modern efforts by the uh, mayor of London um, to think about social cohesion. And here you'll notice that there's an emphasis on egalitarian uh, practices and participation as a part of the achievement of social cohesion, a recognition that our intentionality that we bring to the design of our public spaces can affect the texture of people's daily life, as well as the texture of their public, civic, political relationships with each other. So I encourage you all to visit um, the report that they put out, lots of wonderful designs for thinking about, or ideas rather, for thinking about how intentionality in design can support a healthy civic life. But if we go to the next slide, I wanna make a point about what it means for discourse to be at the center of how we design spaces where we come together. This is a picture of the Hoover Dam. And I love it because it is, of course, a dam that generates electricity, generates power. Discourse is ultimately more about flow than space, in my view. It is about the passage of ideas and possibilities, horizons of imagination from one person to another through communication. And just as discourse flows, it brings power in the same way that water um, flowing can generate power. The dam, of course, is a design. It's a very specific design for how to channel the kind of power that flows through discourse. The public spheres I've shown you, the Greek, the Roman, the coffee house, those two are all designs that ultimately channel power and are about thinking about how the public design and the private design intersect in the channeling of power. Now, this is what brings us up to our most challenging question as we think about public spaces on the internet. It's impossible to have any kind of discourse space around which people convene that doesn't organize power in some fashion. The only question is how you're organizing power and how you are bringing public projects and private projects in relationship to each other in the organization of power. Consequently, once you recognize that, you have to understand that you have to have goals for the organization of power to help you think about the design of public spaces, even on the internet. So I wanna spend my last two minutes here just focusing on the question of what those goals might be for how we organize the space in which discourse travels and where people convene around discourse. So let's go to the next slide, please. This one is the most abstract and dense, so I apologize for that. Um, but what it is offering is a characterization of different polities. That is, it's a way of characterizing how different societies organize their political life or anchor political organization, all right? And so this reflects sort of many generations of work by political philosophers. And it also reflects the premise that the globe is not a homogenous space. Rather, you have different regime types across the globe. And the question of how the internet interacts with those is at the core of what you want in the design of a public sphere. So first, there's a distinction between um, you know, more or less uh, indecent regimes, which are completely rights violating across all dimensions and don't provide material security to their populations, and then decent regimes, which provide some categories of public goods, in the category of indecent regimes at the moment, you might think about Syria, you might think about Venezuela, where populations are obviously been left completely vulnerable to predations of all kinds against each other and from the state in relationship to the population. Then you have your category of decent regimes where there are ultimately five things they might deliver and different regimes are seeking to deliver different ones of these. So this is where we have to set our own goals and make a determination for ourselves. So 
At some level, no regime is legitimate if it can't deliver basic material security. That's an important premise. Then there are the sets of rights we care about. Negative rights are protections of things like expression and conscience and association. Positive rights are rights to participate, to be a co-creator or co-owner of public spaces, to co-design the public life we share together. Social rights are about the provision of education and health, uh, the resources people need in order to achieve full flourishing. And then most importantly, something that we've really only come to see in the 21st century, there's also a potential goal of achieving non-discrimination or egalitarian social relations, or as I also sometimes call it, difference without domination. Protection of the negative rights of speech, expression, association, that generates difference. And difference is a beautiful thing. We do want to associate with people with whom we share a sense of affinity and perspective, and we want the freedom to do that. That will inevitably generate difference. The goal is to support the emergence of difference through the protection of those negative liberties in ways that don't result in difference generating domination. So at the same time that you're thinking about how to protect negative liberties, you also have to think about how to avoid or undo where it emerges domination. So if you think about a China, that's a society that does focus on the delivery of material security. It also focuses to some extent on social rights. It's got reasonable health provision, for example, for parts of its population, not for its whole population, but for parts of its population. And the design of a public sphere for China, if, that, if, if one's from inside a sort of the frame of a China perspective, will focus on those elements and won't be about the protection of negative liberties or positive liberties of participation, for instance. In a constitutional democracy or an egalitarian participatory democracy, we are seeking to empower people as authors of their own lives, which also means authors of their communities. And that does require protection of negative liberties, positive liberties, social rights, and the work on non-domination or an, or an anti-discrimination. So in that regard, I think one of the biggest challenges of the internet has, was the early idea that we could have one thing for the entire globe, that you could build a Facebook and the rules would just be the same everywhere. That's very far from the truth. Every example of people convening around discourse is an example of a public sphere. And therefore, any given society needs to bring intentionality to the design of that public sphere to align with its objectives as a society. So the ways in which platforms work in the US can and should be different from how they work uh, in other um, societies that have different overarching goals and objectives. So that's the frame, now then the hard work starts of how do we get our hands back around the designs that can deliver the public sphere we need through synergies between private and public. I so welcome this festival. Thank you again, uh, Eli and Talia for pulling it all together. So I'm your host, Sarah Hendren, for the next panel, and I'll just wait till the other panelists arrive um, to the main stage here. Thanks so much, Danielle. Uh, I truly cannot imagine a, a single better person to um, give this keynote and to set the stage for us for such difficult thinking work together. Um, I do imagine that folks are going to be arriving, but I'll just start in the interest of time. Um, I am a middle-aged white woman with long dark hair and a black dress, and I'm sitting in front of a stack of books and a big abstract painting that my brother made for me. Um, I want to welcome you to the first panel of this festival in such a week and in such a year. And I want to invite you in just the next 50 short minutes to explore three big, quite big conceptual areas that are alive and very much under construction, as Daniel just said, as our subjects this week. So big areas where I think you could product productively take with you into the next three days um, beyond to sharpen up and maybe give some more dimension to your own thinking from whatever profession or domain brings you here. We'll drop into the first one first, our first area, and that is the familiar and enduring public spaces of our physical cities. And Danielle gave us some of those big typologies from history, but the, the contemporary city, the bricks and mortar, the concrete and parks and plazas of our lives. And we'll think again first about what's made possible and what's challenging about our physical shared space. 
And then we'll make a leap by analogy from the realm of physical to the realm of digital public spaces. And we'll think about what continuities are there. This is that one level down of granularity. Where, how do we make uh, continuities from the physical to the digital? And where do the real distinctions arise that come with the nature of software? And then we'll make another big leap to thinking about public space, yes, as the public sphere, as Danielle laid out, in the political sense that, of course, encompasses both the physical and the digital. And perhaps, of course, it seems self-evident that public spaces become the public sphere. They are the stages and the settings of our lives, the places that do collect us and indeed sometimes collectivize us. But I do think many of us carry around some perhaps overly vague notions about what healthy digital public space looks like. Perhaps we think we recognize it when we see it in a broad thumbs up or thumbs down. This is where it's working. Here's a lot of places where it's not really working. Or perhaps we have a diagnosis that's shaped very much from our own point of view, either our training and our research or the neighborhoods where we live, the cities where we are, we have some sense of what goes well and some sense of what doesn't go well, but we lack a lot of the conceptual handles and the granularity that we need. So the invitation this week is to get that granularity and specificity to invigorate our imagination about public spaces as the public sphere and what it takes to shore up that publicness in our many ways from wherever we sit. Because again, just to underline Danielle's point, the, the mechanisms of influence actually run two ways. We know this, but it's important to say again that our political and civic ideals arrive in our lives in evidence of stuff, so material culture. It's embodied in the material stuff, the way we move and live and extend our bodies and the way that we, the social architecture of our online spaces are a reflection. So from ideals to spaces, but the opposite direction, of course, is also true, that the quantitative and qualitative look and feel and experience in tiny subtle ways of our spaces does shape what becomes possible in our civic relationships to one another, both ideals to spaces and spaces to ideals. And I imagine that many of you come primarily from one spot or the other, and we might engage a, a, like a proper humility about the limits and the affordances of our own space, right? And also a much more robust imagination about the dynamism that's happening in both those directions. So I think each of these thinkers will give us more to think about that we might not have considered before, no matter where we sit. So let me introduce them to you just briefly. Their long bios are on the website, so I don't want to spend too much time there. Um, Gabriela Gomez Mont uh, founded and directed Laboratorio para la Ciudad, or Laboratory for the City, which was the award-winning experimental and creative office uh, of the Mexico City government that reported to the mayor. And she headed a young transdisciplinary team from urban geographers, political scientists, civic tech experts, to artists, historians, and philosophers. I just my heart sings that humanists are right there in the middle of the laboratory for the city. That lab was created to tackle urban challenges at all scales, so we'll hear more about that work. Next, uh, we'll, we have Konstantinos Dimopoulos, who started his career in urban planning, so in that physical space and city geography, and later moved to combine his knowledge of urbanism with his love for designing games. And in doing so, he helped to establish the young field of game urbanism. So since then, he's designed cities, urban mechanics, narrative geographies for tabletop and video games. And he's also the author of Virtual Cities. So he'll be a bit of that connective tissue between those two worlds. We then have Philip Rosedale. Um, in 1999, Rosedale founded Linden Lab and built a virtual civilization that many of you know called Second Life, um, creating an open-ended internet connected virtual world. He worked since then in distributed work and computing and excited by the proliferation of VR, he re-entered virtual design, the design of virtual spaces in 2013, founding High Fidelity. So he'll talk to us about those things. Jay Verdi, um, I welcome from my, my also my home discipline of um, disability studies. Jay is a historian of medicine, technology, and disability. And she thinks a lot about access to public spaces and institutions of all kinds. And people with disabilities, of course, have been way out in front on shaping and reshaping the public space that is the public sphere in the physical space and in digital space. Um, so I'll ask her to talk about barriers and opportunities of all kinds there. She's an assistant professor at the University of Delaware and the author of Hearing Happiness, Deafness Cures in History. So I wanna just jump in if we can. And Gabriella, I'll ask you first about the design of our physical city. So most people can easily intuit what a plaza or an open green space is that is for getting together broadly conceived this kind of idea that proximity 
creates good diversity and therefore health kind of axiomatically. And we know that that can be true, not always true, but I'd like you to talk about some less familiar, subtler interactions that city spaces also make possible that people might not have thought of before when the design is intentionally in a civic spirit. So examples are welcome here, but the floor is yours. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Sarah. I'm incredibly happy to be here. It seems to be such a timely conversation, so urgent and full of raw questions, if not answers as of yet. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, I, I um, headed the lab for six years. I'm a recovering citizen in many ways. I've been out of the lab for about a year and a half and a lot of reflection still. Um, and we had a quite a wide agenda, and I think especially two things are in, incredibly relevant to the conversations today. Uh, one of them, even though you find me in Spain with the sun setting behind me, um, I actually hail from Mexico City. And uh, Mexico City, for those of you who have not been, is uh, one of the largest cities in the world, 21 million people in a metropolitan level, 9 million people city proper. And it is not only the, the it's not only a gargantuan city, but it is also an intensely diverse city in many ways. Like the DNA of the Mexico City, I believe, is unlike any other, just because of the sheer, uh, just like scope of possibilities you can find in it. But diversity is also many times translated into divisiveness. So Mexico City housed everything from the former number one billionaire of the world, now paltry, I think number seven or eight, uh, but it also has one of the lowest minimum wages of all of Latin America. So leading a lab that had to tackle urban technological social questions and very much interested in, in the realm of both public space as well as democratic practices, in many ways we actually had to take into account all of this uh, diversity when we threw ourselves into the very uh, <laughs> arena, if you will, if not yet agora, of what it actually entails to, to, to bring together participatory practices and such incredibly diverse and unique points of view. Uh, so one of our big questions at the beginning was in all of our projects, including the public space projects, first of all, how do we think of this diversity and divisiveness? So in terms of public space, one of the things that we started doing quite quickly which is also this merging uh, point between technology, the digital, as well as the urban and the physical, was uh, to create the first GIS and urban geography, if you will, a view of Mexico City and to be able to map out, let's say for our kids agenda, uh, one of the teams was called the Playful Cities Team, which basically thought of play as an urban making tool and also uh, thought of Mexico City from the view of kids. Uh, believe it or not, we actually have almost 5 million kids under age 14 in the metropolitan area. So that's kind of like the size of Finland. And how do you bring back civicness into that space? And we researched really interesting things such as in, in the forties, there was actually a syndicate of kids uh, talking about Danielle's public sphere that actually got this solved um, because it became so active. So, you know, there, there is so many things to think about the space. But anyway, going back to that, um, even though Mexico City, for example, in terms of uh, both green space as well as public space has more or less the number of square meters per inhabitant that organizations such as the UN ask for, which is nine square meters of green space, for example, per, per person. Um, when you start getting down into the scales of the city and go granular, one of the things that we find is that divisiveness, social divisiveness actually translates into the urban and the built environment as well. So we will have places such as um, the Miguel Hidalgo uh, borough, which has um, almost 42 square meters of green space and others such as Iztapalapa that have less than four and also half a million kids, by the way. So we start, we created tools, for example, of being able to map out uh, how many kids we had in all of the city block by block, cross that with indexes of marginalization and segregation, and then cross that again with lack of access to public space. So we could actually buffer zones and then zoom in. And we created both a long-term plan, but also a short-term plan. So then we get into the, the one of the, the topics that I was obsessed by, which is, Yes, we, we should be thinking about public spaces, which is all important, but how do we actually also translate this into civic spaces as well? Because public space can be a place where many bodies meet, but that there's not necessarily any type of interaction, but a civic space or, or the public sphere that Danielle was speaking about is actually about the intensity of interaction. So then you think about density in a very different way. And when we were rescuing and creating public space in these places where there was none, or actually creating things such as play streets for kids in neighborhoods, one of the things that we found is that it is incredibly interesting to be to start thinking about these micro civic 
typologies, if you will, and to be able to amplify it, not only the coffee place of your or perhaps our uh, town halls of the present day, but how can even, let's say, mom and pop shops at the corner are very naturally a place where information gets concentrated and disseminated. And these public spaces that we started creating because we wanted to translate them into a place where people also came together, not only in, in their bodily form, but also uh, engage with each other. Um, because there's an issue of trust that's quite interesting that I, I can get into later on. Uh, that in a way it's very interesting to see, see not only how we design public and civic spaces, but who designs them as well. So this whole thing of bringing the community together to be able to jointly decide on things was incredibly interesting because in many of these communities, since Mexico City sprawled 35 times in size from the 60s to the 90s, many close kit knit communities became uh, strangers to each other. So neighbors many times don't know each other. Uh, sometimes when we were creating like the play streets and we'd go knocking on doors and say like, hey, you know, we want to do these play streets for the kids. And they're like, no, no, there's not that many kids here in the neighborhood. And suddenly you close down a door and you flood the streets with kids. And suddenly there's a, a voice and a visibility to be had of these people that were basically behind locked doors. Um, so that I think is one of the conversations that has followed me beyond government of again like this transformation of the public to the civic i think mexico city is a great example of how we think about this because we cannot wait for the world to uh to be frictionless as ellie was mentioning at the beginning uh we actually need to go into the very midst of all of these tensions that arise and it's actually going deeper into this deeper into democracy deeper into meeting people deeper into disagreements even that we can come out of it in in other ways um in things such as crowdsourcing the Mexico City Constitution and whatnot, we also had some incredible examples of what that means. Uh, not for the faint-hearted, I must say, but also incredibly interesting in, in terms of how do we start thinking about uh, that transformation of, um, of the urban scape into a civic space in many ways. Yeah, and Gabriela, I just want to underline for people who don't know your work that the, the play streets was literally take, not, not going in always and building new green spaces where there had been none or recreation spaces, but repurposing extant space by shutting down um, car access to a stretch of street to precisely to demonstrate, as you say, to rescue space where there had been none or to recover from some other place and then to make visible just how many kids are uh, actually present in a neighborhood. And the, the dynamism of that, the pragmatism of it, the nimbleness of being able to move and act in those ways, I think is quite something. A lot of times software, I think, is driven by this very frontier mentality of sort of staking a claim and the newness. And the city has this way of contextualizing and binding us to its, its very concrete structures, literally. Absolutely. I think uh, part of the question of how do you travel the scales of the city, that that is another of, you know, it's, it's not only the spatial question of those spatial scales, but it's also a time scale, if you will, that you need to travel. So That's we right. were thinking, like, how do we give tools to th to think about this in the long term? But the immediate term is, you know, start closing down streets. And since this this tool that I mentioned actually took us to some of the most marginalized and dangerous parts of Mexico City, um, in many ways, it was also incredibly interesting to think how do we create, for example, new typologies for, for informal settlements, for example, where the play streets then become permanent. And we're one of a couple of my team members are still working with one of those boroughs um, in terms of these type of projects. And it's also interesting because you need to deal like you there's you cannot be uh, blindsided by uh, idealism. You have to go deep into reality because in, in many of these neighborhoods, we actually had to negotiate with the local drug dealers, for example. And kids, weirdly enough, became a really interesting vehicle to be able to negotiate a safe space, which we're not here to change your ways. That are That's another city department. But how do we actually create a social pact where these become safe spaces because there's kids across the area? So and, and that was actually a quite interesting tool. And I have several examples of how working with a community you can bring in and have much more nuanced notions of what the right to the city is uh, for many often marginalized communities in many ways, such as homeless, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. I want to just underline that the distinction between public and civic that may come back um, in some other conversations. And I want to also pause and see if somebody wants to jump in right away, or I can go straight to Constantinus. Okay, and we'll talk about the design of time. I like to get a little buffer there um, when we're not in 
physical space with one another. So Constantinos, I'm going to ask you next if you can to mark some connections and distinctions between physical cities and virtual cities, perhaps, you know, calling to some of these principles that Gabrielle has kind of given us. Um, what are some principles or metaphors from for public social interactions that you've learned in making that leap from architecture to virtual social spaces? So things that maybe are continu continuous, those kind of productive ideas in architecture that translate online, or perhaps where they fall apart and where the analogy breaks down. So first of all, I would love to thank you too. Uh, being here is uh, fascinating so far and feels lovely already, so thank you. And to introduce myself, I'm Kostandinos. I'm I'm in Greece, I, I work from Greece and I generally stay here and never really leave Europe too much. So it's uh, even more interesting for me to, to be part of this. And before actually answering you, I, I think that I found I found Gabriela's uh, you know points absolutely fascinating because I have this this entrenched uh, thing in my mind that you know generally speaking tools and designs cannot really change much or, or they can just go up to a point and and what she demonstrated was a very very you know impressive example that goes directly against my experience and this is actually pretty nice and hopeful and everything. And it's also something that, that bridges nicely with the fact that sometimes tools can at the very least help us imagine things. And this, this, is, this is a thing that games can do very well. They, they can actually take the abstract and the impossible and the completely imaginary and give it a sort of special form. They can make it plausible in our minds, so probably they are the medium that could perhaps give uh, you know utopia a very a very real sense anyway to to see how physical and virtual urbanism let's say connects we have to understand that they really are very different on one side i mean on on the physical side you have the laws of actual physics you have uh, the laws of humans that dictate how things are to be done and you have very specific functional and societal needs that have to be served on the other hand in in, in virtual space we usually have to only face production restraints and and the limit limitations of our tools and computers and mostly strive to create believable illusions. So uh, if you want to look at it historically, public space in video games was mostly in this, and I'm mostly speaking on uh, single player games, so on stuff you get to enjoy and experience by yourself. Multiplayer games are a totally different thing, which, which I believe we'll go in later. But so um, what, what we first strived for was to recreate the feeling of a real city. We wanted just our worlds to look real, not necessarily function as real. We wanted to imitate and perhaps even become uh, inspired by reality. It wasn't a conscious uh, thought in, in, in most designers' you know, minds to, to try and create the essence of public space because you know public space and i think we all realize that it it has like many aspects to it it can be it can be everything and it can be it, it can change status it can it can be about just connecting spaces in in the city or it can be a civic space as uh, you know danielle for example said a place where politics actually happen it can be a demonstration space it can be something we just enjoy being in and you know looking around it, it's very interesting that um the way people realized the public space in medieval times was like everyone tried to you know make things beautiful so you would create your house as beautifully as possible in order to add to the beauty of the city and this was how you understood your civic duty it was like being part of the beautification project of everything this was a major function of uh, public space so anyway as um as things have become more complicated in games and as, uh, you know, the illusion of reality gets more convincing, I do believe that we do tend to at least look back at the methods that urbanists and architects and engineers use in order to recreate them. For example, we, 
and I think that many, many base their um, designs on the works of, you know, Lynch and their works of uh, Alexander and Butler language, and they try to uh, think about boundaries and uh, the ways that architectural spaces succeed each other and how to create the feeling of uh, awe or alienation or, or coziness, depending on what it is we need. It's still not something that we will um, try to to use to emphasize sociability when it comes to single player game but once again to to help with the illusion of uh, this sort of space but more interestingly when we go to multiplayer games and that is games where people play with each other what we usually do is like try to identify the parts of uh, public space that we care for so that would probably have to be perhaps some sort of um, minimal trade and discussion, maybe the opportunity for people to actually do stuff with other people and enjoy the fact that they are in the presence of other humans. And, and this is where things can get more interesting and, and where the spaces that the tools of gaming allow us to create can become, uh, you know, also the spaces where we get to interact not just as avatars not just as um, you know players but as people who want to discuss stuff so this would be like my very very first uh, approach to things yeah um, thank you um i just want to bring in philip here too because it's related um and i want to bring in another dimension if that's okay constantinos yeah sure absolutely yeah so in a related way, Philip, I'll just ask you to talk about Second Life and High Fidelity, your choice, um, but the kinds of design choices that make virtual spaces do their best social work. And I think plenty of people are used to, to thinking about virtual worlds at the individual level, the node of this user. So I've got my preferences, my settings, and my choices. But of course, it's a different matter to design interactions to make those spaces work as publics. And that's a really more, that's a really, and in fact, we have these professional fields that are user experience and user interaction design, right? The, just the individual node that that presumes when of course our interactions are what make those spaces sticky and welcoming or not. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, thank you. I've been watching that city emerging from the water behind us there. And, and that's so cool. Um, when Second Life began, for those who don't know it, it's a 3D world that was designed to be very open and, as, as Sarah said, um, to be a sort of a scaffolding for a lot of human interaction. And so that's what, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of watching over, my gosh, 15 years now, um, as people have used Second Life. But it actually started as a small... Uh, village like that it was only a few acres kind of quite literally in the water if you walked out to the edge of it in 3d you saw something and if you'd watched a time lapse of it you'd have seen something very much like what we're watching on screen there second life grew we we and, and this is interesting we auctioned off new bits of land at the edges of it as it got bigger much like what we're watching there and so it, the mechanism of that was one of perhaps a bit more capitalism looking back now than than I, I personally think we would have wanted but people sort of spread out into that space but yes as you said sarah the the um the mechanism i was always interested in was what were the low level kind of laws of physics if you will and how would they make people act around each other you know what uh what capabilities what fairness was established what force could people use to um resolve their disputes and i've always been fascinated in this public challenge of structuring the low level rules themselves you know the laws of physics if you will to make the space m more or less you know workable for people and i've always approached the problem of these public spaces or these online spaces with that thought in mind kind of less so the administrative rules which are of course material as well um you know what if when when someone does control the space or to whatever extent they control the whole space how do they act as the administrators but then there's this alternative question which is were there no one there what are the laws of physics and how does that then and I mean that broadly, and how does that work out in terms of, of changing behavior? You know, that's what has been a constant fascination to me in these, well, in my whole career. And, and, and now most recently, we've been trying to do this with high fidelity again, first with VR headsets, and now strangely enough, in this, in this bizarre time of, of COVID, uh, 
trying to redo it in a vastly simplified just audio just a two-dimensional display and sort of exploring what happens there but my fascination has always been with and why i love being here with this group is this question of yeah what are the rules and how does that affect behavior and what are the psychologies and social psychologies of interaction that we have to be mindful of and then how can we optimize that to create uh you know not a good business but a, a real public space thanks yeah and i think i'm going to just bring jay in here too but i want to just note philip that i think i mean i think about uh jane jacobson famously saying it's actually the self-organizing properties of the street that is the the informal planning and the eyes on the street the mixed zoning the ways that people actually live together and do this kind of informal sociality but she was talking about a, a bounded space that did not have the exponential even liquid scale of software um and and so that that's kind of laissez-faire you know letting the laws of physics emerge is a really it's a is a bigger tension it seems to me um and that's where we it took us a while to figure out things like context collapse it's interesting to think about whether that's also in the literature of cities that somehow we missed making the the kinds of connections so i'll ask you to come back in about that but jay um i just want to ask you uh, to weigh in on um you look a lot at, at products and technologies more than at cities but as a disability studies historian um, you're, you've charted the ways that design products often have been formed on a logic of fixing people's bodies when they find that they fall outside the norm. But we know that the material space of our cities, think of curb cuts and ramps and all kinds of fundamental reshapings of the city, even at infrastructural scale, have, has come from the knowledge and the wisdom and the activism and power of disability, uh, of, of people with disabilities, um, who call themselves disabled people, audio, audible pedestrian signal uh, signals you know, policies for assistance animals, all kinds of physical spaces we can look at. And the last year, we've seen, of course, the digital space sub in for material space in all kinds of new ways, which bring their own forms of barriers to access. So what kinds of principles or practices would you hope to see in the design of digital public spaces based on what you know about disability history and technology, both the creativity of that refashioning work and also the urgency of the politics? Uh, okay. Hi. Thank you um, for that great question. I do want to note that um, I'm currently broadcasting to you all from Newark, Delaware, which is the unceded land of the Lenin and Lapi tribe. And to give a very brief visual description of myself, I'm an Indian woman with shoulder length curly hair coming to you from my home office, which is surrounded by books and plans. So the usual historian office here. So um, as I mentioned, a lot of my thinking about disability technology focuses on how disabled people tend to either create or modify the technology to better align to their bodies and navigate through their um, environmental and urban spaces. This does mean that often disabled people encounter barriers where their understanding of technology and their, um, their sense of movement doesn't always parallel with the society in which they live in. And I was listening to Danielle's presentation and thinking about a comment on public design and private design intersecting to channel power and what that means when a person's body is, um, it can be perceived as a barrier for full participation in a democratic society. So, Sarah, you mentioned like curb cuts of wheelchairs. And, you know, it's a very famous example in disability history in where disabled people in Berkeley started arguing that curb cuts would allow them for greater social, civic, and democratic participation in their city because it would allow them to move with their wheelchairs. But it's also kind of a universal design which anybody can benefit from curb cuts, you know, um, people using strollers, people shopping carts, people who use canes and things like that. It just seemed to be a very inclusive design. But I'm thinking more and more about digital spaces because for the past few years, disabled people have, have been pushing this activism that, that digital spaces can be more inclusive for everyone. But in some of the challenges that they advocate for, including, um, for example, closed captioning being mandatory on all public spaces online, have been met with a lot of resistance, if not tension, from companies, corporations, institutions, um, for reasons from um, financial 
um, explanation or there's not enough of an audience or, you know, not really want to put in the design or technical expertise to include something like that. And just a side note, I do want to express my gratitude to New Public for making sure that there is an ARSL interpreter and this excellent captioning, perhaps the best I've seen on a Zoom webinar, by the way. So thank you for that. And I've also been thinking about what it means when we argue for democratic public spaces online and not provide even the basic accessibility parameters. So we've been seeing lots of social media contacts since the summer following the George Floyd murder and the Black Lives Matter protesting, all kinds of social media commentary about politics and public spaces and participation. But most of these content are not accessible. They don't come with alt text, they don't come with captioning, and that further provides barriers for disabled people for being able to participate in these social conversations. At the same time, you know, looking at it in a different vein, these digital spaces are also open to participation. So people who might not physically be able to go out on the street and protest find themselves much more comfortable, if not protected, by participating in online activism. So we have this kind of two approaches to making sure so the digital spaces are accessible. Well, on one hand, they give people and includes their platform to share their thoughts and participate in their own sense of activism, as well as to share the ideas about civic nature. But on the other hand, they can also be exclusive because if we don't use the technology that is in our disposal to make sure these spaces are accessible or we design new platforms with accessibility as an afterthought, but further in, um, propagating these kinds of barriers that are reflective of the more physical spaces that we have here. Now I've been thinking a lot about these kinds of accessibility and how organizations get together to provide these kinds of spaces. So one of the um, groups that emerged in the summer with regards to other social media activism is a group of volunteers who call themselves Protest Access. And they often work with Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to caption any content or provide all text description for anybody who wants that. All you have to do is tag them and they will organize the group of volunteers and do the work. That is a time consuming process. And often they tend to be several hours or several days in some cases behind the um, access provision. But last week, when Twitter was suspending President Trump's video because of the, um, you know, the terrorism on January 6th, protest access actually captured the video that was being, um, being taken down. But then their own account, because they showed that video, got shut down. So it raises this broader question, I think, about if we make the basis accessible for people, to what extend do we also limit democratic participation? So I think when we're talking about both digital and physical spaces and artistical design, it's also very important for us to also think about these spaces as whether or not they are accessible. Yeah, wow. And this is it's, it, what you're saying just reminds me of what Danielle said about the very particular combination of public and private entities that come together, not without friction, but to build those kinds of new worlds. And we're seeing that right now. So we're seeing both AI generated automated captions grow in their fidelity. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like I watched in real time the way YouTube's caption went from kind of comically bad to a little bit better to, wow, really quite good, you know, but then also the debates about the human decisions that are involved in sign and also in live captioning and the standards that make those things possible. But thank you for that rich example of both public institutional work and private work that's you know, working this out right now. Um, I want to, uh, I want to then just ask Danielle um, to come in here again um, and weigh in on the big picture questions that inform so much of your thinking about civic life, perhaps in reaction to what you've heard on the panel thus far about architectural, urban, and virtual space. Um, you often talk, for instance, about the healthy relationality that characterizes strong civic life and there's a rich, ample scholarship in your field about what fair fighting is, for example, as a term of art, right, in thinking about how we interact, what, what fair fighting constitutes, um, about deliberation, disinterested deliberation as part of that healthy relationality 
And again, it begs us to go deeper than this broad sense of togetherness and to say what we mean about the agonism of the public sphere and what it means to be pluralistic truly. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how good friction can be productive in our public lives and how the shape of our digital worlds might shore up that relational health or uh, give you the floor to interact with anything that's been said thus far. Oh, thank you, Sarah. And so actually, let me, I forgot to do my audio description. So I'm a African, middle-aged African-American woman with short uh, kinky hair wearing a blue sweater with uh, orchids behind me, pink orchids. Um, so I mean, this is a fascinating conversation and really wonderful to hear the parts come together. I want to start actually with Gabriella's comments and her point about a focus on kids. There's also a designer who you may know, um, Joel Lamke, I believe, who has a concept called Kid Cities, um, which is to ask the question of if you start by asking, how do we um, ensure that you know the kids are okay, that, that they're healthy environments for young people, a lot of other things will follow from that. And in that regard, it's very similar, I think, to a lens that starts with disability and ask the question of how do we make sure there's access for everybody? A lot of other things follow from that. So in some sense, starting with the most vulnerable and asking how do we make sure this is good for them is likely to deliver benefits for all of us. Um, in that regard, you know, I've had my own recent challenges with my kids of uh, navigating social media and encountering quite dangerous things, in fact, actually, and being um, subject to predatory behavior. And you come to realize that when you send them out into the city, physical city around us to ride their bike, there are street signs and there's road markings. And you can say to them, you know, don't go past X street or past Y street, and they can have their independence within boundaries. And none of those markings are particularly available um, you know, in the internet space. So the point is just that, that suggests that we really haven't asked these questions about how do we think about the broad design in ways that are good for kids, um, broad design in ways that are good for um, communities of disabled people. So I want to just, you know, think those are really helpful frames for giving us overarching goals. Um, and so then the question is, um, you know, I think within that, so those frames, um, how do you sort of bear down on the technical work? And here I think it is actually worth kind of paying attention to the way in which um, we are quite good at some things. For example, we're quite good at privacy, right? And we have like you know, an amazing sort of list of things we do to focus on privacy and user uh, documents and agreements that have to be signed and so forth. And if you think back to my original kind of five buckets of things we have to deliver, material security, protection for negative rights, protection for positive rights, social rights, and non-domination, you know, those really all fall under the bucket of protecting negative liberties. So there's a certain kind of discipline we could bring to the work of just sort of really asking across those categories, you know, how could we design to support these things? Um, and then that I think is, is Philip's point about social psychologies and how they come into play in terms of delivering protections for those different categories of rights and goods. And to some extent, we're gonna have to learn as we go. We don't know the answer up front precisely because um, digital technologies do give us new kinds of infrastructures. And therefore we do have the job of understanding the, the laws of physics, so to speak, the laws of social psychology as they are uh, activated by this kind of infrastructure. Um, so that is key. And then the last thing, just to come to your point about relationships and fair fighting and so forth, um, and I think that is, it's, it is this issue of difference where you started, right? Um, that is the hardest thing, which is um, we, as of yet, even in our physical worlds, actually have not successfully designed infrastructure um, to support productive friction, you know, kind of comprehensively. We have the problem of segregation, whether that's ethnic or racial or socioeconomic. Um, you can find cases of success and so I think in that regard, what one has to do is really try to pull out success cases in the physical world and understand why are some infrastructural efforts going so badly wrong with regard to difference and others going right? And then what learnings can we take from that to port into the digital space? But the point is it really is unfinished work. Um, it deserves a kind of, you know, a spotlight put around it so that we can focus on it. Yeah, Thank you. I want to just pause in case somebody wants to jump in on anything thus far, because I have a, a couple of other questions, but just pausing. Can I say Oops. one more thing about fair fighting? Because I, I didn't really. Of course. Um, so here's a place where I would say, again, we're really good at thinking about privacy, which is to say really good at thinking about negative liberties and just really bad at thinking about positive liberties, participatory rights, participatory inclusion. 
Yes. And it just, it, it's not that there's an answer out there actually. And, you know, a philosopher can just pour it into the conversation. It's that we have to just switch gears and recognize the value of successful participation. The London work is a good example where they really reviewed their, all of the kind of ways in which different social practices were coming together in their community um, to support quality relationality, egalitarian dynamics among people and, um, participation, basically. And I think you have to take those three categories together and use them as the kind of triangles of a design process. Constantine. Yes, what I would like to add would be that the, the major problem that I can think of with the digital public space is the fact that it will, it will come with a preset of uh, laws and guidelines that will essentially define its use. I mean, especially if we want to to make it as impressive and as um, easy to use as possible because admittedly you know the complexity of even getting online is too much for for quite a lot of people and admittedly many don't even have access to the internet or to anything vaguely technological and this is like a, a big percentage of, of humans living on the planet right now so if we are to to give all those people the access and enable them i have the fear that there will have to be some sort of really powerful entity enabling them to come online and participate and this entity will most probably have the power to keep the conversation safe for itself so this this might for example you know limit the political conversation limit um uh descent up to an acceptable point and this is something that i cannot imagine is a purely technical question and it's more probably a, a political or, or ethical one and i'm not certain as to how exactly we could go around and fix it at least for now i mean we could easily discuss how the people that already are here can you know create their spaces, which are like subsets of a true, truly public space where they can discuss and protest and whatever, but like making it on a global space for everyone, I, I think it's going to be really well, difficult. Can I just say, I want to get Gabriela in here, Constantinos, but I actually do, when you say they come with preset laws and you're imagining global scale, it seems to me those are also human presumptions, right? That, that are driving mm -hmm. the, we're going to hear from Front Porch Forum in Vermont where in a neighborhood forum, you can only post once a day. There's a temporal friction there. So mm. You don't get into, I learned about this from Eli, you learn, you don't get into flame wars because you can't be mad for two weeks over the cycling thing in your neighborhood as you can on next door. You can just okay, like, you know. So the subtleties of that friction seems to me does in fact shape those preset laws, right? That it's not just a free for all, Everybody, anybody say what they want in real time. But you can intervene, it seems to me, and shape. We just have come to accept a quite short history of the social internet and the way that it works as though it must be that way. So, but Gabriella, do you want to talk a little bit about participation and its... Absolutely. Yes, I, I, I actually wanted to add a, a little bit to Constantino's uh, comment about how much design can seem or not or not be or not be gratuitous and one of the things that we found quite interesting is actually studying even the architecture of power in terms of even the office spaces of many of the ministers or the mayor himself there's so many things that happen subconsciously they're signing uh, signaling hierarchy they're signing who belongs there and who doesn't um who's allowed to speak and who isn't and so one of the, the, the places that we created as, as one of these typologies of civic spaces, we had a, an amazing huge rooftop in Mexico City. And we opened it up not only for, we thought, okay, like how do we actually turn a public building into a public space as well, where people not only come for services or complaints, but actually to share ideas, to debate them, et cetera, et cetera, and to our huge surprise, um, because one of the things that I didn't mention in terms of even designing for trust, um, Mexico City in the last, few, Mexico rather, in the last Pew survey, 2018, um, only 8% of Mexicans believe in democratic practices. So I mean, that was the challenge that we had at the beginning. But at the same time, we found that when you open the doors for discussions, it's truly astounding to see how many people want to come in to discuss ideas about their city and not only to talk about them, but actually to sink the, their hands into the city themselves. Um, so we had, it was truly interesting to see how even the, the, this, we designed the space where we would take away, we, we would take everybody's ties away. No mayor or minister, ta ta ta. It was all um, 
on a first name basis. And we, for the most convoluted subjects that we had talking about uh, fair fighting, when we were putting together activists and people for government for the first time, and really wanted to see where, how we could create a, a coalition of, of the willing, if you will, for things such as road safety in Mexico City, um, we found one of our secret we weapons was what we call the sobremesa, which was putting together people to share a meal, usually over dinner. I confess we also had mezcal, which is, you know, probably the secret, we the secret is to weapon and most powerful one of them all because it just puts you in a nice little hazy mood. But it's, it's truly astounding to see once you shift, um, the design of a space and play with people's expectations that that even allows for different conversations to happen and talking about the global scale i do believe that one of the things um to start thinking about is how do we create how do we again travel the scales of things and, and work more in assemblages and also understand that there's so many a priori that we need to get into because if we if we think that we can just like slap a, a civic tech space uh, on, and layer it on top of society as it exists, we're, we're going to get exactly where we are now. And it's really interesting to see cases such as Uruguay that were, you know, they preceded Barcelona and all of these other places that have become quite famous for their, their openness in terms of digital democracy. But they, they you know, uh, Uruguay has advanced in terms of being incredibly socially progressive at the same time as their technology opened up in advance as well. So how do we start thinking about education and civics? How do we think about these other civic spaces that need to happen at many scales, both at the neighborhood level, the street level? Um, and well, no, I think I'll stop there, but there's so many thoughts uh, that come from, from the conversation right now. Yeah, I'm gonna just see if other folks wanna jump in. Well, I want to just get down then to the um, to the how questions, and so I think we can all name the questions and the importance. I want to talk though a little bit about prototyping trust. I've been thinking about this a lot in design spaces, and I want to you know just I know a lot of people here are designs designers and engineers of various kinds, and they are tasked with the building and the choices, and there can be a kind of sclerotic process by which people think, oof, now that I know these can be tools of harm. I am more, I'm more cautious, which is a good thing, but it might actually prohibit some of the creativity, the piloting, the breaking art, sort of shedding some of the old scripts about how we're gonna interact online for fear of that causing harm. So I guess I wanna to talk to you all about prototyping as a kind of disposition for what builders do. That is, so in my neighborhood in Cambridge, Mass, you know, shared streets was piloted at small scale, reversible small scale. So we had three streets initially with, you know, temporary bollards and things, and then we had the signage and community feedback and so on. But there was plenty of chatter online about saying, trying a new thing will never work, and I can tell you why, and the kind of self-satisfaction of that, right? And I think that the trust in sort of powers that be is not just earned by sheer conversation and discourse. I mean, Danielle, I wonder what you think about this, but by the prototyping, those piloting of little projects and delivering new imaginaries for ways that we can be so that you then establish that trust from which you then can proceed in redesigning the worlds that we want. It's a delicate balance. And I think a lot of people who do human-centered design and engineering work think, well, you build consensus first, and then you make something. And it's just never that, it's never that linear. I wonder if folks have thoughts about that, people who are tasked with the building work. I, I would add, and, and let me say for my audio description, this is Philip, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a middle-aged uh, white man sitting in a spare room with a ladder behind me. Um, uh, I would say that I, that's such a good point, that this difference between experimentation and, des and uh, design up front. I, I guess as someone who's worked on this stuff all my life now, maybe it's just that I'm dumb, but I doubt it. We as humans are not able to predict the outcomes of most of these systems that we're designing. Not even close. The, the, the sort of design... Uh, matrix, you know, we're only able to imagine doing two or three things differently in a digital space. And there, and I guarantee, I mean, I, I really think that we have no idea what the outcomes of those things will be. So we must prototype. And yet, especially today, I feel as a person involved in building things in tech, I and I respect this this problem, I feel like there's a huge amount of anger directed toward tech at like, rashly deploying things that are ultimately harmful for people. So how do we strike a balance between 
knowing that that does often often happen and then also respecting that we have to experiment like all many of the emergent outcomes in second life there's no way i would have guessed at them and i was super philosophically interested in all this and passionately engaged in what might happen but i was reading jane jacobs thank yous there at the very beginning that was one of the books that really inspired me about building second life but i could never have guessed at all the interesting strange emergent things that happen so how do we strike that balance when everybody right now I mean, not everybody, but a lot of people probably don't want us to experiment. And I get that. Not certainly with the exponential scale that seems to be the default mode of, of software and built into its architecture. But there again, may not be a foregone conclusion. What are the highly localized and bounded forms? Who else might have some response to this? I'm just adding to Dela, your comment about prototyping. You know, um, with regards to disability technology, there's often a pushback from the disabled community because the prototypes are often like prescription. There are solutions designed by non non um, disabled people to fix this disability asset. But often they're designed and engineered without the input from the disability community and pose even more challenges than it actually required. So two examples come to mind, and both of them, by the way, can be very nicely described by um, the design critic Liz Jackson term disability dongle, in which you have a solution for a problem that disabled people never actually knew they had. And these two classic examples are the stair climbing wheelchair, which rather than just dismantling barriers by putting ramps you just have this complicated technology that in some cases is actually exclusive for wheelchair users that just climb stairs. And another one is this um, sign language glove, this computerized device that you wear in your hands to translate ASL to the spoken word, even though it doesn't actually capture the intricacies and the intimacy of the language. So I think when we're thinking about prototyping, um, many of the disability technology never go beyond the prototype stage because they actually don't solve the problem. I'm sorry, they don't solve the issue that they believe is the problem. And we think on a more broader scale in spaces and urban centers, to what extent can these kinds of um, prototyping actually be exclusive for some people? Can I jump in here for a second, Sarah? Um, I think this is really important and um, somebody put it in the chat as well that what we're talking about is an iterative design process. And that is absolutely key. But I think the other thing I would put alongside the iterative piece is a sort of inclusive conception about stakeholders. So one of the problems with emergent phenomena is that the timescales of emergence are kind of unpredictable. So in that regard, you need to make sure that you've got the kind of farthest sided people, so to speak, um, who care about a particular thing connected to the problem because different communities of users will see things sooner than others because of just what they care about, what's salient to them. So we have to like maximize our temporal capacity to see emergent things and that you only get through diversity um, of stakeholder inclusion. So it's a combination of iterative um, with the inclusive. And also I think Gabriella, your work demonstrates a pretty expansive notion of kinship and shared stakes, right? Including uh, overlooking some of the, you know, complications of a city that might exceed your bounds, but nonetheless working together. Um, I mean, you've, you've thought a lot about this, about the thorny nature of participation. Absolutely. And, and I do think that many times uh, creating um, these tiny microcosms it basically lets you, allows for more voices to come in, because I, I do think that there's an interesting uh, way forward in terms of how do we do politics of possibility or how, how do, do we do policy that signals possibility, if you will, where it's not necessarily the government that comes and creates the whole sentence, but you start off a sentence or you just point to something and create the framework of a space or a story that people can write themselves into in a way. Um, so we found that when we were prototyping certain types of projects, for example, um, that were weirdly controversial, because I would have thought that, for example, creating public space for neighborhoods would be uh, just like a, a no brainer. But it turns out that neighbors were worried about everything from noise to uh, attracting people to their uh, to their doorstep, because in many of these uh, Mexico City, 60 percent inform started 60 percent as a, a self-built environment. So informality was a big way that Mexico City 
uh, got built. And so, but public space was never accounted for. So one of the things that we worked on closely was how do you create typologies in, and create public space where there isn't, as I mentioned. And a really interesting thing were, happened that we had to work very intensely with neighbors at the beginning, which was actually quite incredible because in some neighborhoods, the neighbors didn't know each other. So it was actually an excuse to create conversations that had not happened before. But once we had the first, for example, permanent uh, kid street up, instead of having to um, push her way into the hearts of people, it was actually the other neighbors looking at that and saying like, why don't we have one? You know, that's completely unfair. So I have the feeling that there's something incredibly powerful of not only of thinking about public and political imagination at the same time as we think about these other things, like how, how do we open up that space and sense of possibility? Um, and how can actually our, our projects, both in the digital as well as the urban space, actually point to that which could be possible or or because so many times we're constrained by what we see and what we're immersed in. Um, so uh, yes, I think that that's an interesting space to explore. Uh, and yet, I mean, I just, I wanna bring into, I think my colleague uh, Mara Mills is here today and Mara was, we were on a, uh, doing an event together about AI and the, the, just the scale of corporate ownership of data and the way that drives the way AI and, and machine learning function in designing our online interactions. And Mara said that, you know, historians talk about the way that these software platforms have become governance without government. So mm -hmm. as opposed to what you just described, Gabriella, of the way that you build at the site of the, the municipality and the informal city and the knowledge sharing that happens and so on, that the proximity that's implied there, that you go, we've gone straight to governance without government at the scale of software. I mean, is that a, Danielle, is that a thing that comes up in um, kind of uh, ethical circles around technologies and software? I'm just thinking about the distinction between governance as a, you know, de facto capability as opposed to government as an institution. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, I think governance is a theme that understanding of governance is sort of atrophied in the general public, also in the world of policymakers. I think we have gotten too reliant on the idea that you develop a solution up front and then you just implement. And governance is not implementation, right? Governance is about creating a shared purpose. That goes back to Gabriella's story about the meal together. Yeah, and then iterating through the solution so that there's genuine ownership. When I was talking about participatory rights, that's about co-ownership of what you're making together. And then that builds legitimacy. Legitimacy is the purpose of governance, is to ensure that as you deliver concrete solutions, you're doing it on a sturdy foundation of legitimacy. So you need that process of working together, um, really, I think, to deliver um, you know, healthy, uh, socially productive results. Yeah. And that's a very different picture of policymaking, I just want to say out loud, too. It's not just a difference for technology, it's a different picture for policymaking. Because in policymaking spaces, too, the idea is that you, you know, blueprint a macro level solution, and then your job is to implement. Um, and we're instead talking about working our way to the solution, um, emergently through process, uh, it's a total transformation of conception. Yeah, and requires, it seems to me, a kind of intellectual flexibility that can dive deeply down into details and then revisit the macro. It's that it's an iterative intellectual process, I think, too, right? Being radically attentive to the, the texture of daily life and then also, you know, this kind of the, sort of hopping you know, yeah. big dynamics. And if I if I may add there, um, in, in terms of cities as well as technology wanting to optimize for efficiency, uh, this is not efficient. So the, it's a completely different ethos. It's a completely different set of principles. It's a never ending question conversation and it does not stop. It is not solved. You do not solve a city. You do not solve a digital space. You do not solve governance. Um, so I think that that's where one of the biggest tensions lies right now. Exactly. It's the overarching objectives. If your only overarching objective is a kind of cost benefit analysis, you can have a blueprint and try to implement, so to speak. But if your goal is participation and that co-ownership of the results, then by definition, uh, it all has to proceed differently. And it's, it is not efficient in the same way that uh, cost benefit um, approaches. However, insofar as you secure social trust and the foundations of legitimacy over long arcs um, of effort and work, it is, I think, in fact, d delivers positive social results at a much higher level, which is a different way of thinking about what efficiency is. Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, and I, I just have to call out again, Gabriella's team that included 
the humanist nature of um, folks in philosophy, folks in the arts that tend not to be shunted into the machinery of efficiency and systems in that way, but nonetheless draw our attention to this much bigger idea, Danielle, of thriving and flourishing. No? Mm. It's like, I wish my country understood a tiny bit of this, right? The wisdom that is there in trying to create the systems that we want. Anyone want to have the last word? Because we're at one minute. Anything you wanted to say that you didn't get to say? All right, I thank you so much for being game to do these kind of big conceptual leaps and find the analogies and where they break down. I do hope, thank you so much to um, folks, you know, animating the chat and and uh, adding your questions and your ideas. Uh, there's plenty of um, space to go and discuss. Thanks to our hosts and to New Public for just, again, shoring up the imagination that we can, it can be otherwise. We can have a designed otherwise future and the, the civic possibilities therein. Um, so thanks again to our guests and I'll turn it over to New Public. All right, welcome back everybody. I hope that you enjoyed your break. Got to stretch your limbs a little bit. I saw some people moving around uh, in Zoom. So here's what's gonna happen next. We're gonna hear from Eli and Talia again, followed by a Q&A with the director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford, Rasmus Cleese Nielsen. Um, Talia and Eli didn't want to do the good old fashioned PowerPoint presentation. So instead we sent them out into space and really kind of went for it. So get your Slido ready. Remember that's that Slido link that we we're using earlier for the word cloud. Um, look for the link in the event hashtag in the chat and help me welcome Eli and Talia. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. And we're delighted to share with you what we've been working on for the past two years. Uh, this past year has been crazy. There's a good reason that the word unprecedented has been used all the time. This is everything from governments changing to a global pandemic. And what the pandemic has really shown us is that digital spaces are really important and all the problems in digital space are well worth our time to address. This is everything from mis and disinformation to hateful rhetoric to all forms of undesirable content. These things really have important consequences in society. They can lead people to do things that they wouldn't otherwise have done based on false information. Efforts to mitigate all of these harms are incredibly important. But at the same time, we wanna take a different tack. We wanna think about what does it mean to create good or positive or thriving digital spaces? And what is a vision for what digital space could be? So that's kind of why we're here together today to zoom out and ask, you know, leaving aside what exists today, what do we want? for our future digital life? What do we want for our kids' digital lives, for democracy? And we're gonna share some thoughts on this question based on a few years of research as a start, as a way into this conversation, but not as the definitive word. But what you'll hear today is a bit about how we approach this question, and then kind of this framework that emerged for thinking about what the qualities of public friendly spaces might be. And then some really interesting survey results about how super users all around the world evaluated existing platforms on these qualities. So you're probably wondering, why are we so focused on the good when there's so much bad that we need to address? And the truth of the matter is that we need both. Think of it in another context. Blood pressure medicine helps to keep us alive. And that's a really good thing. But that doesn't mean that we have a healthy heart. You have to exercise, you have to eat right. And it's the same thing in digital spaces. We do need efforts to try to mitigate some of these harms. But at the same time, we want to think about what are the qualities that make for successful, flourishing digital spaces. Before we get to the qualities, though, let's talk about why we keep using this word spaces to think about digital platforms. Our belief is that how we think about systems, how we conceive of them, has a lot to do with uh, what we do about them. And the metaphors that we use are really important. Research has shown that you know, when people imagine crime, for example, as a wild beast, they endorse different policies than when it as a disease. Or, you know, when they think about national debt through the metaphor of household debt, then they start to get worried about things like foreign foreclosure on that debt, which is not something that can happen. Or, you know, when we talk about a marketplace of ideas, we kind of make two errors. One, that marketplaces necessarily promote the best products, and second, that speech fora work like marketplaces. 
So for the internet, one of our most uh, kind of dominant metaphors has been this one of people exchanging information and mediated by algorithms. And we might imagine, you know, sort of the people as nodes in a network, a graph, um, and they're sharing these packets of facts and ideas with each other. And there's a lot of value in this metaphor, obviously, um, you know, being able to abstract human systems and turn it into this kind of um, graph. But the danger is that we start to imagine uh, that what human beings primarily do with each other is exchange information. And even worse, that, they, that what we primarily do is sort of exchange and internalize facts. And this can lead on the one hand to this kind of overly rationalistic model of human society in which, uh, you know, the, the, the question is just, you know, sort of how do people internalize facts that they're seeing? Um, on the other hand, it, it leads to not thinking about all of the other stuff about human behavior, how we come together and act, all of the nonverbal things and the emotional things, and most importantly, kind of the nuanced thing that is human relationships. And so we wanted a better metaphor, and we started thinking about what are other metaphors for digital platforms? We thought about the body, maybe we could talk about healthy platforms or about large systems working together, but those weren't quite right. And we eventually settled upon spaces, and spaces open up a whole different way of thinking about things. They mean thinking about how people interact with one another, their nonverbal cues, their behaviors, the way that groups come together in these spaces. And this allowed us to start thinking about what does it mean to have an offline or physical space and how does that translate into a digital space and vice versa. And this unlocks all sorts of playful opportunities. So for example, take next door. Uh, this reminds me if I think of the equivalent in physical space of a community meeting in my neighborhood where not everyone knows everyone else. You have someone that's ranting about how everyone's speeding. You have another person that says something vaguely inappropriate. The meeting goes on way too long because no one can get everyone under control. And you, you can think about it that way, but you can also envision then other sorts of experiences. So for instance, I think about the experience of when I'm in a park and my kids are running around with other people's kids and I'm chatting with other parents and we're talking about the world and we're learning about what's happening in our community and we're establishing these connections. And this can be a fruitful way to then think about how do we take those principles, that experience of being in a park and establishing these great connections and translate that then back into digital space. So the other thing about the space metaphor is for us, at least, you know, it was a source of real hope because it suggests that the things that are going on in digital life um, aren't necessarily all new problems that we need to solve. They're actually very old problems and in some ways as old as humanity. Um, and we have these disciplines that we can draw on. We have architecture and urban design and community building um, that have been around for centuries, sometimes millennia that um, can inform our answers to these questions. That's why you know some of the paintings you'll see behind us are drawn from a film by William White. He was a colleague of Jane Jacobs in the 1970s. Um, and he was an acute observer on why some social spaces in New York City thrived while others weren't as uh, vital or, or, or relevant. And um, that work is as useful, we think, to the consideration of how to build better digital spaces as anything that's been published since the internet. So the other piece is, we've really come to appreciate in the last 20 years how much value these spaces have for society, that public spaces are the places that knit people together, that they actually can save lives. Um, Eric Kleinenberg, a sociologist, has pointed out that neighborhoods that had more public spaces in a Chicago heat wave actually had lower death rates because people knew to call the guy who sat on the bench in front of the library and check in on him during the heat wave. So we need these spaces and uh, understanding how to build these qualities in digital life is really important. And let me just be clear, as we heard in the panel earlier, you know, that's not to say that we've solved all of the problems of physical public space. They're still incredibly complicated and contended and politicized kinds of uh, questions that emerge here. But it is to say that there's this wealth of wisdom that we can draw on and that we've done parts of this before, that we've made some of these same mistakes before, and that there's something that we can really learn from here. And we can take lessons from what we know about how to create good spaces in the physical world. So for instance, our first idea is to think not only about user-friendly design, but also to think about public-friendly design. 
platforms are often designed thinking about user-friendly design. It's asking, how do you optimize things for an individual? But if you look at physical spaces, they're not designing for an individual. They're designing for groups. They're thinking about how people can interact with one another. And one person's desires may be different from another. And so it's actually sub-optimized for individuals, but optimized for groups. And this is exactly the sort of thing that we think platforms could draw upon when they're thinking about designing for the public. The second lesson we can take from physical space is actually tailoring these spaces for particular communities. Physical spaces often do this, where you're working with local residents to figure out what they'll use it for and why they would do it that, why they would want the space to be one particular way or another. Digital spaces, on the other hand, aren't normally designed this way. They're designed with the idea of reproducibility, with scale. So you often hear uh, discussions of how, how can we scale this? And we think that there's a lesson to be learned here from physical space about translating this idea of local, of working with residents to build something that really could apply to digital space. It's the same question as thinking about how would you want a space to be different for people interacting with a government representative, for example, than interacting with their friends. And we think that this is a really important question and lesson that we can learn from how physical space is designed. So the third lesson we can learn from public spaces is that there are these recurring attributes and design motifs that pop up again and again in successful public spaces. One example that I love is the curb cut, which is this little ramp that is cut out of the sidewalk so that uh, originally folks with in wheelchairs after World War II could make it more easily from the street to the curb. And what started in Michigan as a fairly, you know, small design intervention spread worldwide because it turned out that curb cuts also facilitated lots of other activity. They allowed parents with strollers to get around easier. They allowed bicyclers and skateboarders um, and folks who were pushing carts. And um, they made spaces a lot more accessible and a lot more inviting. So I think our research project is kind of asking this question of what are the qualities like accessibility that we want to have in digital public spaces so that then we can start to build the pattern library of design interventions like curb cuts that help us achieve those qualities. So in order to find the qualities of digital space, what we did is first we went to the literature in order to see what people had written about in the past. And here we looked at everything from philosophical texts about the great society or the great community all the way to popular writings for what makes a really thriving digital space. Next, what we did is we talked to experts from around the world, and this included political scientists and psychologists and sociologists and activists from diverse political viewpoints. Then we developed an initial set of signals and we took these to users in five different countries and focus groups and asked them what they thought. This led us to revise the signals and add some new ones. And then finally, we fielded a survey in 20 different countries with over 20,000 people letting us know what they thought about the signals and how the platforms were performing. So what we found was 14 kind of important qualities or what we're calling signals, and that they clustered in four groups, what we're calling four building blocks. And there's a lot more that we're sharing on our website right now at newpublic.org. We've got white papers that go into detail on the signals and more in-depth survey and methodology data and videos. But what we wanna share with you right now is kind of the top lines of how these building blocks work together. Um, and then we'll get into some of the survey results about how platforms actually did. The first building block or set of signals is to make people feel welcome. And what we mean by this is that people need to feel safe in these spaces. They need to be inclusive, particularly for marginalized groups. And when we looked at our survey results and what we learned from the focus groups, this really was such a fundamental idea. It was a foundational set of signals that people needed to feel like they were comfortable in these spaces and that they could express themselves before they could get to any of the other signals that we'll get into here in the next few moments. Welcome is also particularly important when we're talking about tech because we're already in a non-face-to-face -face way. It's very easy for us to feel dehumanized when we're, when we're talking about uh, spaces that are virtual. So creating a space that's really welcoming is the first and most important building block that we uncovered. So the second building block is connect. And, uh, you know, we've heard this word a lot when describing digital spaces. Um, but what we know from sociology and from lots of other fields is that, you know, building healthy communities isn't just about connecting everyone to everyone else, that it's actually about how we connect that's critically important. And uh, there are lots of examples of, you know, you can bring different groups into proximity with each other 
and they can increase trust of each other and respect for each other, or they can decrease trust or respect from each other. It's not just that they're in proximity, it's how that's mediated. It's what the structures are around these groups that really, that really shape um, how they come to see each other. And so some key elements of healthy connection include kind of feeling validated and a sense of belonging. And then also, you know, having these channels of connection to other groups. And that latter part is really important for equity concerns because um, we need these bridges for information to flow along like job opportunities, for example. If those can't propagate through a network, then you end up with some groups having more opportunities than others. Our next building block is understand. And we don't mean this simply as the exchange of information and bytes and algorithms. We mean it a little bit more deeply than that, by which I mean, we mean how do we grow and reach understanding together? How do we work together to find out what's happening in our world and our communities? It's not only figuring out this reliable information, but it's also learning about each other and how people are different from us and what makes them different and how they, how they figure out their own viewpoint. Even more than this, it's figuring out how we can work together to improve our communities and improve the world. And this brings us to the final building block, which is ACT. And ACT, I think, is really important because when we talk to political scientists and sociologists, um, you know, they said, yes, connection is important, understanding is important, but um, there's something special that happens when groups of people do something together, when they build something together. And it kicks into motion this kind of positive flywheel where people act together, they trust each other more, and this reinforces their sense of community and their sense of willingness to participate and act. And so, uh, you know, it's not enough for public spaces just to facilitate um, that people understand and connect. Um, what's really great is helping people actually do something together as a community. So when we put this whole system together, all of these building blocks, here's what it might look like in space. And again, you know, there are a ton of details on the signals and how we're thinking about them, uh, what the survey says and our methodology on the website. But now let's talk about, you know, okay, we've got these building blocks, we've got the 14 signals. How did the platforms do? How did super users think that our current digital environments are faring in these qualities? In order to figure out how well the platforms did, the first thing we needed to do is make sure that we were set on our list of signals. And the list of 14 that we've called together we think that this is a pretty good list. A lot of people told us that we captured the things that they think about when they look at these digital spaces. Granted, there's lots of room for improvement, and that's why we wanted to initiate this whole conversation and festival in the first place, but we think we've at least got a good starting point. So there's general agreement on what the signals are, or at least the starting point, but where there's lots of variation is how well the platforms are doing. And there's variation depending on what's the platform, and there's variation depending on who are the people. People evaluate these platforms differently depending on where they live and who they are. So to reach this conclusion, we did this survey across 20 countries and we asked people about 15 popularly used platforms. The results really give us insight in terms of whether these platforms really are public friendly. What we'd like to do in the next few minutes here is give you just a little taste of what we learned and there's a lot more information available on our website. When we talk about all of these results, we're really focused on what we're calling super users. And these are people who most frequently use particular social media, messaging apps, or search engines. And so we wanted to know what did super users think about how the platforms were performing on these signals. And the first really major takeaway is that there's lots of room for improvement. We asked people to tell us whether the platforms were performing well or were performing poorly with respect to these signals. And so we developed a measure that ranges from zero, which means that every single person said the platform was performing poorly, all the way to two, which means that every single person said the platform was performing well. And across all of the signals and all of the platforms that we evaluated, the highest score any platform got on any signal was for Reddit, and it got a 1.5. It received a 1.5 on the signal cultivate belonging. Surely we can do better than a 1.5 on one signal by one platform. There also were some signals where none of the platforms performed particularly well based on what super users said. And these include encouraging the humanization of others and really importantly, ensuring that people feel safe. And on LinkedIn, make power accessible is the fourth most highly ranked signal. Um, it's ranked a lot lower in other platforms and it's rated above average by super users on this signal. LinkedIn super users also rank show reliable information as very important 
and award the platform an above average rating on that score. So fitting with this theme that no one platform can do it all, there are actually a lot of interesting insights for individual platforms. Let's start with Facebook. Super users of Facebook across the world rank the signals, keep inf people's information secure and show reliable information as the most important signals for Facebook. But they gave the platform the worst ratings on these two signals. If we look at Reddit super users, they were unique because they ranked promote thoughtful conversation as the most important signal. None of the other super users on any of the other platforms did this. And they also thought that Reddit was doing a pretty good job. They also rate Reddit as doing a good job with respect to signals like feel connected and provide opportunity for different groups to interact. The survey also enabled us to look at differences by subgroups because it turns out that even though most of the time people rate the signals as similarly important and they give the platform similar ratings in terms of how they're performing, there are also really interesting differences if we look at people's demographics and their political attributes. So what we did is we looked at the five platforms for which we had the most data, and this included Facebook, YouTube, Google, Facebook Messenger, and WhatsApp. And when we looked at these, we tried to figure out, do people think differently about these platforms depending on their political identity or depending on their demographic characteristics? When we looked at gender and age, there were differences about half of the time. In general, women and those who were older thought that these signals were more important and they also rated the platforms as performing better with respect to these signals. Education was another really interesting thing to look at. So generally, you know, when we ask people how important the signals were, people with different educational backgrounds tended to feel pretty similarly. But when we ask people about performance, the educational backgrounds mattered more. So in those cases, people with lower levels of educational attainment generally thought that the platforms were doing a better job than people with higher levels. And one big question when we got into this was thinking about those with different political affiliations. So were there differences between those on the political left and those on the political right? Now, this is an international survey. So what left and right mean really varies depending on where you are. But overall, when we look at this, there were some interesting patterns. About half of the time, those on the right believed that the signals were not as important compared to those on the left. And they also thought the platforms were doing a better job than those on the left. Now, there were exceptions to this, and the exceptions are really interesting. So, for example, for WhatsApp, those on the political right, in fact, said that several of the signals were more important than those on the political left. And if we look at how people evaluated the platform's performance, super users on Facebook and YouTube, they were actually more likely to say that the platforms were doing poorly. Those on the political right were more likely to say that the platforms were doing poorly on the signal of giving everyone a chance to share their views regardless of their background compared to those on the political left. These demographic and platform differences really drive home the point that no one platform can do it all. Overall, across all of these findings, what we really hope that we're doing right now is starting a conversation. We think we have a starting point for thinking about the signals, but this is an opportunity for all of us to work together to think about what is it that we envision for a good quality, thriving, flourishing digital space. We need to figure out how we evaluate existing platforms and using public opinion like we've done in this point is just one of many mechanisms that we might use to figure out if the platforms are performing well. It's also important that we think about how these signals could inspire new and existing platforms to design differently. And we want this to be a collaborative conversation, which is why we have the festival in the first place. So we can all come together and think about what is it that we want to do to create digital spaces that really rise to the level of meeting these signals and working as flourishing spaces. So in conclusion, we think it's time for a bolder public imagination for the internet. We think figuring out this question of how to build equitable and constructive and public friendly digital spaces, spaces that do the same things that parks and libraries do in physical life is like a critical mission for the 21st century. And it may feel kind of impossible you know, especially if you're an American like me, we're accustomed as a culture to looking to our grand future visions, uh, looking to, to entrepreneurs for our grand visions for the future. But there is this incredibly inspiring history of public innovation as well that we can look to. You know, the people who created public parks and gardens and high school and libraries. And these were institutions that citizens decided, you know, we needed to stand up because there were critical gaps missing in our communities. And I think that's why we're here together today to, to find the imagination 
and the vision and the community and the connectedness that can make this happen. The depth of dysfunction in our society and in our technology can really feel overwhelming a lot of times. But I think when we zoom out, we can see that human societies have encountered these problems many times before, and we can take heart in the fact that we've overcome challenges of coordination and communication and community building many times before. In the end, the hope is in each other. Thank you. Thanks very much to Eli and Talia for the presentation um, and the quite striking visuals as well. And uh, thanks to men for introducing me. My name is Rasmus Nilsson. Uh, I'm the director of the Reuters Institute for the study of journalism at the University of Oxford and professor of political communication. So I will take some questions from the Slido. Uh, this is a rich discussion. There'll probably be more questions than we can take in the next 15 minutes. So I'll encourage everyone to pursue them in the chat function with one another, um, either uh, through back channel um, or, or on social media or elsewhere too. But just to sort of start us off before we dive into the Slido, um, Eli and Talia, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what you think the role of research is in driving this conversation towards an understanding of what good public uh, friendly design looks like in a digital environment. Um, hopefully there are some things we have in common, um, but might there also be areas where we simply disagree um, and that some people will ask for more um, um, consistent enforcement of existing content moderation policies, for example, even as others will feel that such enforcement is a form of censorship, uh, as we see very powerfully right now with um, allegations by Republicans that they're being censored, calls from Democrats um, for more enforcement, uh, things that are not just US discussions, but also happening, for example, in India, where BJP has been very critical of decisions taken against Mr. Trump, uh, just as the Indian Congress uh, has, has uh, supported the decisions made by some of the platform companies. W what do you think the role of research is in informing this conversation, which I suppose is also in part about uh, principled disagreement or different interests and identities? Talia, do you want to jump in on that or should I? Either way, go ahead and then I can jump in. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think um, one of the conclusions that we came to, uh, the more time that we spent with uh, the, the survey results and the more time we spent talking to folks is that, um, the, you know, there is no way to optimize digital space for everyone. Uh, and for every community or culture that that's sort of a fundamental challenge of our current digital landscape is where we're trying to fit um, different cultures and societies with very different norms and ways of being into one, you know, or into a handful of containers. And um, so I think that in itself is one, one important piece. Um, I think the other piece is, you know, the way when we think about this metaphor, and we think about the public spaces that exist in the physical world, you know, there is this uh, element of kind of community feedback and ownership often that helps shape what the norms are in a space, what's acceptable. There are places where some kinds of dress are acceptable and other other places where they're not. And that's um, something that's mediated by by community feedback mechanisms. And we don't really have those in in digital spaces so i think to your question what's the role of research uh, you know what we were looking for is kind of um a set of qualities that we could identify that were pretty consistent yeah, and how i can speak to that um a little more uh, you know so that and someone mentioned kind of a pattern language we could then start thinking about well, what are the different patterns for how people might design around these qualities and I'll just add to that, that I think there's a really important role for research here. I think it's first in surfacing what are values or things that we can agree upon are things that are important for public space and digital public space for that matter. And I think what we'll find is that there are trade-offs among these, right? You can move the lever on one and maybe it, uh, maybe it affects the other in a certain way. But if we have a wide variety of different platforms and we agree on these values, even though we might agree, might disagree on which one needs to be prioritized or which platform really speaks to us, we still have this rich ecosystem in which we can all 
uh, in which we can work together. And one thing that's really striking about the signals is how much agreement there really was. I think when you move this to the space of like, what are our values? What do we want? You actually see more agreement than you might anticipate. And I think that if we start the conversation there, then you can start to have trade-offs like, yeah, we want free speech, but no, we don't really want people to be able to do certain types of free speech. And there, then you can wrestle with them, but you're still wrestling with the meat of the values that everyone can say, this is a good set of signals or values for us to play with. Uh, thanks, uh, Eli and Telia. It's, it's good to be reminded that there is evidence to suggest that we have more in common as human beings than the fact that we exist in Newtonian space. Um, I'm gonna resurface a question here from JSL from the Slido, uh, which I think pushes further on this uh, issue of disagreement, uh, which effectively is a question about whether even in the situations that Telia are right to highlight where we say we want the same thing, um, maybe sometimes we mean different things uh, with the same words. So JSL asks, does what look like welcome for some look unwelcoming uh, for others? So uh, Talia, jump in here when you, when you want, but um, that question is a great question. And to me, it brings to mind uh, the work that Nathan Matias, and uh, I think he may be around or maybe uh, some of his uh, colleagues may be around, um, has been doing, which is really um, thinking about what it means to encourage participation in this space and the way that norms and rules, contrary to the way that we often think about it, actually are a critical part of encouraging participation. So um, what Nathan found on, on our science in a study that he did was that when you published um, you know, more clear rules and guidelines, um, you saw not only more participation by first time users in general, but particularly folks who are kind of coming from, um, you know, more marginalized or disadvantaged backgrounds felt more comfortable because they felt like they understood what the rules of the space were and presumably, you know, felt like there was someone who was going to be watching those, those rules. And so I think what we mean when we say welcome isn't a free for all. Um, and that's a common kind of misperception of how folks think about that, but it, but it really is trying to address this tragedy of, the, of a, a lot of internet spaces, which is that so many people just silence themselves because they don't feel totally comfortable that they're welcome to speak in the first place. And to us, that's you know, a, a big loss. And what I'd add to that is I think that in our research to date, uh, this is actually one of the limitations, right? We've talked to super users. So these are people that in some way have bought in, although certainly we saw plenty of criticism from those that were super users. But I think that it begs to ask the same sorts of questions of people who aren't using some of these spaces. Why aren't they using them? And what what might be the fault in terms of the signals maybe not being, uh, not being present for them? So I think that that actually is a, a wonderful provocation for where we could take some of this uh, in future iterations. Thanks both. Um, in your both your framing of the issues that we face as societies, but also in your research findings and interpretations of it, you stress that we can't and, and maybe even shouldn't seek uh, for a single platform to be all things for all people, a, 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 a view that I s certainly share personally. Um, and I think this is a question that is alluded to in, in a point that's been raised by an anonymous participant on the Slido who asks, if you were someone with aspirations of creating a new platform, how would you be thinking about the signals? Where would you start? Uh, wonderful question. We hope that the signals are used in this way. And if I were doing something like that, I would start from the very beginning thinking about how do you create a space that has at its base, at its foundation, these signals. So I might look to physical spaces that you think perform particularly well on these signals and ask how can you translate that to digital space? I might look at particular digital spaces where I thought that these signals were performing well. And even from our survey, what sorts of platforms are, are quantitatively ranking well in terms of performing? And I would draw all sorts of inspiration from physical space, from uh, existing digital spaces, and from the very beginning, bake it into the values that are put into that platform. Yeah, I would also say, um, and again, there's more of this detail on the website, but um, there's so much room for improvement on a lot of these. 
And um, one in particular that I think just about no platform was seen as doing especially well on was humanization. Um, and, uh, you know, that seems like a really important uh, project to be thinking about, like, how do we build digital spaces where people come away with a real sense of, of other people as human beings? Um, I know Juliana Schroeder is somewhere around and we reference her work, but um, thinking partly about, you know, sort of what's possible in text only mediums versus other mediums, if, if you want to accomplish that, seems like a really interesting direction to go for, for this. I'm going to pick a name now that um, someone has asked under, um, under their own name. Uh, this is Robert Bjarnson who asks, um, when we think about this diversity of platforms and diversity of, of signals and design principles, how, in your view, can bottom-up nonprofit approaches to building public digital spaces work in our hyper-commercial world? Um, I can jump in on that. Um, uh, you know, I think that's a really critical piece of the puzzle. And, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit, but uh, when you use the spatial metaphor and you think about all of the different kind of institutions and spaces in a physical community, um, and, and folks talked about this in the panel earlier, you know, there are uh, private businesses, absolutely, but there are also um, libraries and parks and all of these, all of these civic spaces that are, uh, you know, if you, if you try to imagine what a library would look like as a VC-backed startup, it wouldn't be a library anymore. It would be something else. And so um, I think the role for these situated, um, you know, uh, non nonprofit enterprises that are, that have the expertise, that have the kind of maintainers in them that are helping do this work of weaving the community together is incredibly important. In some ways, I think it's like one of the biggest things that's missing from the way that we imagine how the tech landscape is supposed to work as we like often often forget all the how how critical that work is in in human societies if i can just add uh, in case robert or others are interested in it that uh, obviously there are scholars who worked on nonprofit approaches like christina dunbar hester in the united states and at the risk of coming across to those of you who are in America as if I come from an alternate reality where as I only come <laughs> from Europe, um, it is also perhaps worth pointing out that there are discussions in Europe about what we might think of as a public option. Uh, and Natalie Helberger in particular from the University of Amsterdam has done really, I think, impressive and interesting and important work in that space. Um, Thanks. And actually, while, while we're on that topic, let me just say uh, both tomorrow um, and Thursday, we'll hear both from some entrepreneurs of kind of new, new forms of public space and from Ethan Zuckerman and others on Thursday who are, who've been thinking about this. So it's a theme that we hope to return to. Thanks, Eli. Um, I'm gonna return to another theme that uh, has really resonated with a lot of people who've asked questions in Slido that you alluded to as well in the presentation. Um, and it's the point about how you're thinking about how different platforms uh, serve different functions. Uh, how do you think about this sort of looking forward to kind of the sort of public friendly design principles that you hope will underlie um, our digital space in the future? I mean, I think Eli just started our thinking down that path, which is if we look at the signals right now and see what's missing. Humanization is a big one, for instance. Uh, ensuring people's safety is another one where we actually find a lot of people saying they're, they're not totally satisfied with the existing offerings. And so I think that these are opportunities for new platforms to come in and to really do a good job at some of these things that people broadly say are important. They say they're interested in this. And so I think that the, the signals expose these, these new options and opportunities. And at the same time, we can also see existing platforms uh, try to do better at some of these things, particularly the ones where people say they're really important for the platform and the platform isn't performing well. But we actually think that it's pretty impossible for any platform to do them all and do them all perfectly well. We have to have this, this uh, diversity of spaces uh, that satisfy different signals uh, while trying to achieve all of them, but recognizing that there are certain spaces that will probably need to be quite distinct from others in order to make it all work. If I can push you just a little bit further uh, on that, Talia, I mean, are, is what you're describing sort of roughly analogous to thinking about the way that 
say the New York Times and NPR and Fox are competing with one another, uh, not just on sort of technology and content, but also on identity and principles and, and ethics in a way. Um, is what you're describing a situation in which we should think of design principles as a competitive differentiator, basically, between different platforms with different business models? I would say yes, in terms of potentially a competitive differentiator. But I think when we're thinking about the world of the signals, we're thinking about things like maybe there's a place where you particularly go where power is accessible, where you have a chance to talk to those in uh, positions of power. And maybe there's a platform that really does well at that. And then there's another one maybe that really helps you to cultivate belonging and feel like you're connected to others. And I don't think that's analogous to our current media landscape because they're certainly not competing on these signals. They're competing using very different means from that. But I do think that there's a landscape where whether it's competition or whether it's just places that have naturally found their, their niche, their place where they, they have provided a space that really satisfies this public goal, this public uh, signal that we share. Thanks. I'll take a last question, I think, in terms of these, just the interest of time, um, which um, I, I think, again, returns to one of the themes, um, which is a question, again, from an anonymous participant who asks, what, if anything, would be lost if we fractured into smaller public spaces than the big platforms that tend to dominate much of online space right now? Such a good question. And I, I think... Um, you know, I think there, it's easy to feel some um, nostalgia or preemptive nostalgia for the notion of kind of like one, one global connected medium, even though that's really not, we, we don't have that now, uh, you know, very much. I mean, it's, it's not um, a reality in how we use these platforms mostly. And so um, I think uh, looking to a world where we have public digital spaces that are doing the work of public space, which means it's not all people like me. It's not all, um, you know, uh, uh, frictionless. And there are these opportunities to see, um, you know, a, a larger whole. Um, that seems really critical. Whether we can do that, you know, all in one at, at one global scale seems to me to be a, a, a very open question, but I think, um, you know, I'm really interested in sort of the opposite, which is like, yeah, how do we build much more localized spaces that do some of this sort of social weaving work um, that then we can maybe build upon? And I think that that's absolutely correct that, you know, there's some movement toward these more localized spaces, but I think the parts that we have to make sure don't get lost in the process are one, the ability to understand the concerns of others. So if you just start to form local bubbles and then concerns that might be really important for another group never come your way, I think that's problematic. And then the second is to make sure that we still preserve these opportunities for an incidental or, or accidental encounter with someone else who you might not know. And you know, I find this happens to me on Twitter, for example, where I never knew someone and all of a sudden we, we have lots in common. And I think that there's something really important about uh, the ability of social media, for example, to do exactly this. Well, I mean, the signal, Eli and Talia, that you sent to us that you um, wanted to pursue here was to start a conversation. Uh, and my strictly scientific analysis of the questions coming in on Slido is that you have succeeded beyond your wildest dreams on that. So I'll just thank both of you for the colorful presentation and the rigorous thinking and empirical work and for fielding all these questions. There are many more in the Slido and on the chat, and I'm sorry I couldn't uh, find time to file file uh, all of them to you, but thanks so much for kicking this off and for all the work that you and the team and everyone involved um, has do, done to start this conversation. Thank you so much.